Ever wondered why volcanic eruptions in Hawaii are relatively safe, while those that occur in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State are incredibly dangerous? The difference between relatively placid Hawaiian volcanic eruptions and explosive Western North American ones is closely connected to the silica and gas content as well as the temperatures of the magmas. So let's dig in and find out what all of this means. Magmas that contain a lot of silica will tend to have a thick consistency, kind of like flow like treacle. Uh, magmas that behave this way are said to have a high viscosity, which just means that the magma doesn't like to flow very much. Now, magmas that contain lesser amounts of silica will tend to flow like water and are said to have a low viscosity. Viscosity then is best defined as a fluid's resistance to flow. A high viscosity and it doesn't like to flow, a low viscosity and it does like to flow. The viscosity of magma alone, however, is not going to determine the nature of a volcanic eruption. The other important factor is gas content. Uh, magmas with both a high viscosity and a high gas content will tend to produce explosive volcanic eruptions, such as those that occur in Western North America, while those with a low viscosity and a low gas content will tend to produce effusive volcanic eruptions, such as those as we see in Hawaii. Now, let me explain by using a bottle of champagne. Unopened champagne contains abundant carbon dioxide gas. You can't see the carbon dioxide, however, because it's under a lot of pressure, and that occurred when it was bottled. When you pop the cork, the pressure on the gas is released, and we say that the gas comes out of solution. When this happens, we can see the gas in the form of bubbles, which quickly expand and make their way to the atmosphere through the only opening available, which is the neck of the bottle. Now, unless you vigorously shake your bottle, you typically won't lose any of your expensive champagne. And that's because the champagne has a low viscosity and the gas bubbles can escape quite easily. But what would happen if the fluid in the bottle had the consistency of honey? Once the top was removed and the pressure was released, all of those dissolved gases would come out of solution and try to make their way through the rather narrow neck at the top of the bottle. If you had enough gas, the honey would literally explode out of the bottle, causing quite a sticky mess. Well, that's exactly what happens in explosive volcanic eruptions. When the pressure in the magma chamber is rapidly released, it causes the gases in the magma to quickly expand and move upwards, taking the magma with it. Since the volcanic vent is typically very, very narrow, it causes the magma to erupt in a very, very violent manner. Now the opposite occurs when the magma has a low viscosity. In this case, the gases can escape quite easily and don't explode in a violent manner. Now importantly, viscosity and gas content can also be correlated to the shape and size of the volcano. In Hawaii, effusive eruptions flow easily over the land, producing thin and geographically extensive basaltic rock layers. As the fissure, or the opening, uh, continues to erupt from a central location, it will take on a gently sloping dome shape. Uh, these are called shield volcanoes. Now, shield volcanoes uh, typically only have a very, very mild slope of between about sort of two and 10 degrees, and they have a length to height ratio of about 10 to one. The islands in Hawaii are essentially a series of these kinds of shield volcanoes where most of the volcano is actually submerged underwater. What you see in this image is literally just the tip of a very large volcanic iceberg. Composite or stratovolcanoes, as they are sometimes called, are the product of high viscosity magmas and abundant dissolved gases. These volcanoes violently toss magma and hardened volcanic material called pyroclasts 
into the air. When this hardened material falls to the ground around the vent, it causes the material to build up a very, very steep slope around the flanks of the volcano. When high viscosity magmas are depleted in gases, however, it allows the magma to flow out onto the slopes of the volcano as lava. These lava flows help to cement together the pyroclasts that were deposited during the previous violent and gaseous eruption. This tends to create a very high elevation of volcanoes with two different fabrics. One uh, made up of loose pyroclasts and one made up of solid lava flows. And, and this is why they are called composite volcanoes. Now, unlike shield volcanoes that have very low angles, composite volcanoes can get as steep as 25 degrees. They have heights of up to 8,000 feet and have a length to height ratio of about four to one. A third type of volcano called a cindercone can erupt on the flanks of either shield or composite volcanoes when the gases far outstrip the presence of the magma. In cindercones, only pyroclastic fragments are deposited around the flanks of the volcano. Unlike their massive counterparts, cindercones only achieve heights of about 1500 feet, although they do tend to be quite steep, having slopes of about 33 degrees and they have a length to height ratio of about one to one. Now, perhaps the most fascinating and equally terrifying phenomenon associated with volcanoes is the dreaded pyroclastic flow. Uh, these flows occur when rapidly depressurized magma explodes from a volcanic vent and turns into a ground-hugging 1,000 degree hot cloud of pyroclasts and dust traveling at speeds of up to 420 miles per hour. I mean, move over Godzilla, these things are gobsmacking beasts. Now, it turns out that pyroclastic flows are responsible for nearly 50% of all deaths associated with volcanoes. Now, for those of you who live in Hawaii, relax. Fortunately for you, pyroclastic flows are only associated with explosive composite volcanoes. For those living near the Cascades, however, better go see your real estate agent. The most famous of all historical Cascade mountain eruptions is the one that occurred in 1980 when Mount St. Helens exploded and literally blew its top off. More than 60 people were killed in this eruption, many of them by the pyroclastic flow that flattened the forest for six miles on the mountain's northern side. Okay, well, it's time now for our creation fact of the week. Did you know that volcanic activity over the past supposed 500 million years does not accord well with uniform materialism or actualism? Here is a graph of volcanic activity from the Cambrian all the way to the present. The y-axis represents the volume of material ejected from any single eruption, and the x-axis uh, represents time in millions of years. Now, in total, there are close to about 200 data points on this graph, all of which come from this exhaustive data sheet published by PL Ward in 2009, which is easily accessible online. Now, for the sake of clarity, I only use data points that had both the time and the volume of ejected material. There are many other data points that don't have one of those or either of those. Now, according to actualistic and uniformitarian thinking, the size of volcanic eruptions, which in this chart is expressed in terms of extruded volcanic material, should average out over geologic time, producing an overall horizontal trend line. Now, yes, some volcanic events will be incredibly large and others will be equally small. But overall, volcanic eruption size should average out to produce a horizontal trend. And this, of course, is the major tenet of actualism. But this is not what we see. When a trend line is added to the data, we actually see an overall decrease in the size of volcanic eruptions. And this isn't an artifact imposed on the data by selectively sort of choosing a range. This general decrease in volcanic eruption size can be seen at every scale. Here is the same data over the last 200 million years. Notice that the trend line is decreasing. Here is the data over the past 70 million years, 10 million years, 2 million years, 500,000 years, 100,000 years, and 
10,000 years. Notice that in each case, the trend line is always decreasing. Now this general trend is also true for the effusive eruptions associated with large igneous provinces or LIPs, where huge tracts of land are covered in so-called flood basalts. Now this decrease in volcanic eruption size, it's not trivial. Eruption volumes during this period, for example, were about 10 times larger than those that have occurred in the last 100,000 years. Now, these data could be skewed because we only have three data points for the Paleozoic. We do, however, have many, many more data points for both the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, where the average eruption for the Mesozoic was 4,000 times greater than for the eruption volumes of the past 100,000 years. But wait, there's more. Uh, not only do volcanic eruptions uh, get smaller over time, it also turns out that they become more frequent, much more frequent. In this bar graph, you can clearly see that volcanic frequency is much more prevalent in the Cenozoic. Breaking the Cenozoic down into 10 million year blocks shows that there have been more volcanic eruptions in the last supposedly 5 million years than at any other time in Earth history combined. So what does all of this mean? Well, some might say that decreasing size of volcanic eruptions is associated with the cooling of the mantle. But the minor amount of heat lost from the mantle over the supposedly past 500 million years, it doesn't accord with such a dramatic decrease in volcano size. Others might correctly point out that most volcanic activity is actually associated with plate tectonics and subduction of plates at continental boundaries. So more than likely, this decrease in volcano size correlates in some way to plate tectonics, and this region here, for example, might signal the breakup of Pangaea. But that doesn't explain the absurd decrease in volcano size. Remember, according to uniformitarian principles, Earth's plates have always been moving about. What one should expect to see is a ladder-like increase and decrease in volcano size, but at the same time, one should also expect a general uniform or horizontal trend over geologic time. Now, some might invoke the so-called pull of the recent, whereby the geologic record gets sort of more obscure the farther back one goes in the distant past. And I guess this is possible. But keep in mind that geologists and paleontologists have been able to piece together vast ancient ecosystems using just bones and local rock assemblages. It would seem strange that even the smallest of volcanic eruptions, like for example uh, Mount St. Helens, would be completely erased from the geologic past. Uh, taking the geologic record at face value then, we are left with some rather powerful evidence of an absurdly non-uniform, catastrophic geologic past, and one that fits very well with the biblical account of a worldwide curse that change the natural order of things, as well as a global flood, where we are told that all the fountains of the great deep burst forth on a single day. Okay, so our text for this week is 1 Corinthians 1.21, where Paul says, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Have you ever thought that people would come to know Christ if only they could see through science that the earth is young or that Noah's flood really occurred? Well, spoiler alert here. According to this text, Paul says that only the foolishness of the cross will bring someone to Christ. Human wisdom and reasoning, according to Paul, will never bring anyone into a personal relationship with God. And this, as Paul says, is in accordance with God's wisdom and thus his eternal plan. Creation science is important, don't get me wrong. But this discipline, it's more for the believer than the unbeliever. Uh, think about it. Do you really think the unbeliever is going to accept that God created a planet in six literal days? No, of course not. Uh, this fact, along with other supernatural occurrences such as the resurrection of Jesus, can only be believed. And they can only be believed by those who have first come to know and trust in the foolishness of the cross. Well, that's all for now from me, Dr. C on creation geology for beginners. You can find more creationist resources, 
from me, uh, both here and here. Uh, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for fast access to future videos. Thank you and goodbye.